In the next one hour or so, I will tell you the story of Bimuba people with the Ghana version as the epicenter of the story. Stay glued to your search as I unfurl this story of rich cultural tradition of the people to you. Welcome to Bimoba land, a vast territory of northern Ghana. This ethnic group is concentrated in northeast and upper east regions. Bimoba folklore has it that the tribe descended from the Songaya Empire in Mali, which was liquidated in 1591. Some notable cities of the erstwhile empire are Gao and Timbuktu, all in present-day Mali. The Mobes who settled in Burkina Faso, formerly Upper Volta, are called Fada. Those in Niger are called Gruma. Both versions of Bimobes are reckoned to be interchangeable because they are common in Africa's Sahel region and deemed to have common heritage. Their descent towards the coast of Gulf of Guinea did not come without struggles. Bimoba people were resisted by other tribes, such as Mampushis, who allegedly employed Ivorian mercenaries called Chekosis to assist them establish dominance over Bimobes who had entered Ghana and Togo. Those in Togo are called Moba. They are called Bimoba in Ghana, a semantic that hybrids British and Moba since Ghana was colonized by the British. Even if the relationship among these ethnic actors is fast forwarded to contemporary times, one realizes that Mampushis only lost their stranglehold over Bimobes not quite long ago. Until the latest review of the Chieftaincy Act in Ghana, the Moba chiefs were enskinned by the paramount chief of Mampurugu, who also had traditional responsibility for pass of Burkina Faso at the time. These allegiances are weakening under system realignments. Thus, a chief like Naba Dazuri of Pipira in the Upper East region of Ghana, previously enskinned under the old order, now turns to the Bokunaba. On the journey to present settlements, the Mobes heading to the then Gold Coast, now Ghana, were either accosted or attacked by slave raiders to cover in natural caves in mountains. Some prisoners of war were kept in caves. Maternity duties were also performed in caves for pregnant women. Some of the caves served as places for keeping lions and bees. Leaders considered the direction of the bees as an oracle and settled at places where the bees perched. Bimo bears in Ghana marked this historic epoch in a festival called Danjua. This simply refers to wars conducted mountains against rivals or enemies. Kikira in Upper East region is far from of this celebration. The chief, Nabada Zuri, otherwise called Kikira Dana, or owner of Kikira land, means his council of elders days before the Grand Deba. There are chief linguists, a warrior, a queen mother, a magajia, who organizes the women, and the chief elder who acts as the chief's deputy. The chief meets private visitors who are introduced to a cross-section of the community in a palace ceremony. On this occasion, a new youth chief was outdoored. Also here were Togolese cultural dancers. As this story wears on, we will understand the Togolese component better. Danjua Festival is here. This was the 16th edition and the chief of Tikira, his retinue, dignitaries and visitors, non-resident natives as well as people from surrounding towns and villages attended. <laughs> Also present were the regional ministers for Upper East and North East, a member of parliament for Tempani, the Bunkurugu Naba, the Nakanduru Naba, the representative of the Boku Naba and politicians. The theme for this event was environmental protection and sustainability. If you look at the road from Boga through Boku to Garu to Congo to Widana to Buburi to Pukura to Denugu, it is terrible. We would feel that the government should try and do something to assist us. 
again from Denugu to Bungpurgu to Nalirugu, too bad. We would appeal again something should be done. If only we are able to harness our strength and our resources and tap into this, I am very certain that no region will come closer to the Upper East region in terms of traditions and culture. The culture of a people, it engulfs and binds the natives of Pipira in the Upper East region and by extension the Bimoba ethnic group. They might be in the minority in Ghana, but the aggressor form actually underscores the fact that it is a large and strong monolithic force. They trace their ancestry or their roots to prehistoric Malian Empire, but they actually straddle a number of countries, such as Ghana, Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso, and the Central African Republic. Their ranks were divided following the colonial balkanization on the African continent and across time up to today, economic migration has also contributed to their dispersal. The day after the Danjua festival, the chief of Pipira, Daba Dazuri, with an entourage crosses the border into Togo, which is five kilometers away. He comes to Northern Togo on a dual purpose. Firstly, to thank the Bimoba brethren for joining him to mark the Danjua festival. Secondly, to perform rituals in honor of the gods and his ancestors. You are watching this documentary on GBC24, a documentary on the Bimoba ethnic group of Ghana. But as has been said already in this documentary, this particular group can be found in many parts of the West African sub-region, including uh, Central African Republic, which is in the center of uh, the African continent. Uh, we have just entered the Togo part of their land, and uh, it was led by the chief of Ipiri, who has met his counterpart on the Togolese side. They are just conferring on peaceful coexistence and how to forge ahead in unity and development. And so from this point of the documentary, we are going to see part, the segment that captures life about the mobiles on Togoland. Keep watching and don't move away. Many chiefs of Bimoba extraction were buried at the foot of the Danjoro mountain in Togo. It was from here the forebears led their subjects at wars. It is believed that trees, landscape, sacrifices, hilltops of mountains and valley downhills are possessed by deities. Accompanied by the gendarmerie of Togo from the end, the chief of Pipira meets with traditional rulers in Togolese villages lined along the border with Ghana, such as Wakambu, Marche, Mpela, and Lotogu. Here, they wear cordial exchanges such as gifts and by word of mouth, and they make merry to cement relationships. As indicated earlier, the Togo version of Bimoba is Moba. At this stage, we are on their land, and one of their first signposts here is this cemetery. The Bimoba people handed this piece of land for this cemetery to the Catholic Church. It was to say thank you to the church for assisting Bimobas on the path towards enlightenment. This led to the cancellation or the end of the practice or spectre where Bimobas perform ritual killings on children with congenital defects. Homage is paid in memory of an oldie called uh, Turingma who settled here. Clans of the tribe were named after his three sons. The first son called Nabag Jua, or representative of his clan in present generation, will be the first to hit with a stick the donkey brought to Togo for the chief of Pipira for sacrifice. The blindfolded donkey goes down immediately after the first stroke, although four other strokes follow. The animal falls on the ground in motionless state, obviously dead, even before it is pierced with sharp instruments. To understand this, let me take you to another scene where only a few elders led by Pipera Dana goes there to perform rites. When you are hit with a stick from this groove, it is reported that the victim will die. Such was the stick that hit the donkey to his death 
within a twinkle of an eye. Strangers to the land who are allowed there after observing some rituals could make requests, which natives say are met by the deity. But wait a minute. There is one condition. The one whose requests are answered is expected to come in one year to thank the deity. Just one year. No more, no less. I understand the place is so sacred that even when our cameras follow them, it will cease functioning. But essentially, it shows the power or the mystical powers of the gods. They go in there barefooted, and there are several objects involved here. Kola not a donkey and a cock. The donkey and the cock are meant to say thank you to the gods and the people of Togoland and the Bimumas who stay here. But the Kola knots are meant to represent each clan he mentions, 32 of them, and anyone who happens to belong to any of the 32 clans within the Bimuba land will take one of the Kola knots. Killing a red cock is also a part of the sacrifices made, and the many feathers scattered on the ground is evidence this aspect of the sacrifice is long standing. Now, donkey is gone, the carcass is meat for those interested. The animal is not allowed to observe his killers for fear of haunting the killers. Once the sacred animal is dead, the way is clear for consumption of its meat. Pukura will take another bite. Then the Nani clan will take, you know, the breast part portion. But those days something happened. The senior sons and their younger brother went to the bush to do hunting. And they went to kill a bat. And there was struggle for the better part of the meat. So what happened was that the senior sons rather, you know, a bat doesn't have a tie because he's tiny. So they decided that, you know, because he was young, he should take breast here, the other one would take breast here. So that he, the younger one, would take the tie. But you know, it's taboo, it's natural that if you're a senior, you need the, the, the tie. But he refused and took the breast part. So the guy, the, the, the younger one, which is Nani, decided that I am coming home with that portion of my meat to come and report to my father. And he reported to the father and this is what happened. The father then said, okay, you the Nanigama, you are the owner of the, uh, the, the oracle. You have sold your, whatever, your birth uh, uh, right to your, your, your younger brother. So as we are going to say this meat, the Nanigama is the one who is doing this sacrifice. And is supposed to be the one to be the first person to take the, 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 the tie. Then followed by Pupra and then Nababa. So the significance here is that we are not coming to share it, and then we all take our portions and leave. Far away from here, inside Togolese territory, the team was led to another point of traditional significance, spiritual water bodies. This stream, locally called Dung, it is habitat of a Bimoba deity. It is said that no one drowns in it, and the water never dries out. When the stream freshets, water channels out of it through natural passages. It is also believed by Bimoba people that the Dung catches the bad women of their land and sends them away to other destinations through connecting rivers and seas. Nearby, two streams intersect, and the force appears to channel into the white or black volta into the sea. The high tidal Yeo stream has upper hand over the Aduk in the spiritual encounter. Small hollow wells in this environment were dug to trap horses in past conflicts. Nawat Jaji represents the chief of Togolese town called Tapialem. Farms in the catchment area are beneficiaries during rainy seasons as water sprinkle out of control and end on farms. In dry seasons, farmers suffer, not to talk about nomadic cattle headers whose activities destroy farms. Farmers in Togo appear to echo sentiments by Ghanaian counterparts against the cattle grazing phenomena. Out of Togo and on his way to Nakanduri in northeast region, 
The chief of Pipira made a stop on a bridge under which tributaries of Yiyo and Aduk streams pass. Recalling the force with which the two streams clash, eventually the Aduk subdued, the chief noted that in the past, whenever a royal was crossing the bridge, it was heralded by acoustics as playing the flute or the sound of a flute, or in modern times by blowing vehicle horns to signify the sacredness of the place. Around this place and elsewhere in Bimoba land, locals pointed to us deposits of clay material which are recovered and mixed with salt before being used on buildings as paints. Name of this chemical compound is called kaolin, part of group of industrial minerals. The product which naturally comes in different shades of color is what northerners apply on their traditional round houses built with mud. Houses stand far apart from each other to allow families to farm around the houses or the spaces left around the structures. These are common structures in northern parts of Ghana where they are built without windows yet provide a cooling effect against the hot sun. With the exception of a 2 megawatt solar farm at Navrongo in Upper East Region built in 2014, Ghana has yet to take full advantage of the bright and intense sunshine in the north to power electricity. Jeremiah Kansuk on the cowling. All you need is just to mix with uh, kerosene, then uh, you'll be able to paint the whole house. The other color is also on this side. You see the brown color where we used to coat it. <laughs> you understand? Where we used to coat it. So you can see that somebody had just come within these days to dig this place to go and paint either the house or the room. But this is the only source of paint we have around this area. The highest point of an escarpment believed to be horizontally the longest in the West Africa sub-region is at Nakpanduri. Paths are carved for waterfalls. What a sight to behold. Ghana's first leader, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, put in place the accessories for this natural landscape for touristic purposes. For which reason, he put Ghana under a tight microscope to have a clearer view of the landmass for specific development. That this facility is in the state that it is now, in a state of abeyance, shows that posterity is failing to build the superstructure of the foundation that he set. Stones were placed on a diagonal course to allow Dr. Kwan and Kruma and visitors to climb to a height from where they could catch panoramic view of the landscape. This scene is a mock exercise of how Dr. Nkrumah planned to sit on the stone to be flanked by northern chiefs. A small depression was made in the stone where he was to place his drinking bottle or any light item whilst he indulged in conversation. His planned visit to this cup in 1960 was truncated when he came under bomb attack at Kulungugu in Upper East on the first leg of an itinerary. Trees planted around the stones are called peck by the Bimoba tribe. A guest house attached to the scarf by Dr. Nkrumah is largely unattended and its contents considerably depreciated. <laughs> Dr. Nkrumah was advised to allow the planting of paint trees around the guest house, which was to host very important personalities like himself. The tree is believed to possess spirit powers to exercise evil, drive away male violence, or diffuse attack by the enemy. I'm saying that in the moment of this tree, it's very significant. If you are going to settle in a place that you think that there are a lot of enemies that might attack you in the night, in those days that I'm talking about, what you do is that this tree, you have to look for it and plant around your gate, maybe in between the, where you are going to pass through. And this tree is called pin, in the mobile language, pin. Pin, if I can directly translate it, means that the, can I say Saka, Saka of 
Nakwanduri Naba David Kansuk Nagol Bila states that the conflict prone area no more has carefully imposed on it as feuding parties have put the peace pipe, buried the hatchet, and extended olive branch to each other. The traditional ceremony that engendered the thaw is called blood burial. I know of oil fields. The Eastern Corridor will pass through oil fields at uh, uh, this place. So I'm just, yes, just uh, 10 kilometers from here, or 10 kilometers, 5 or 10 kilometers from here. And those oil fields, it has been confirmed. They came here, they conducted a workshop, they called the chiefs and people of the area and told us what this will mean for our development. So the oil is sure. And I know that this is our scalp we will be filled with minerals. So if studies are conducted, surely they will come up with the requisite minerals. He says the Nakpanduri scalp is fit for use by paragliders and sightseers, an untapped tourist destination that requires capital injection to clear the mud on the jewel. Yeah. Investors should come in their numbers. Come and then invest for in whatever food they can find a thousand. Now we have uh, uh, Nakpanduri guest house. It was built by Ankuma. It was built at the highest point. In fact, it was built at the highest point of the Gambaga Cup. They say they call it Gambaga, but we think it should be called Nakondi Cup. Because the highest point of the, the Cup is at Nakondi. Not far from where in Kuma put his guest house. And in fact, at another place, there was uh, where he placed a flag of Ghana. That is the highest point of the Nakondi Cup. We put uh, the flag there, but we don't know what he wanted to do. So I would say that he was thinking of putting a, pra a paragliding uh, facility there. Bunkurugu is also a town in the northeast region of Ghana. It was at the center of violent conflict in the struggles between two gates to occupy the skin of Bunkurugu. The paramount chief of Bunkurugu traditional area, Na Alahaji Abuba Nasingmong, also discourages chieftaincy disputes and highlights peace for rapid development of the area. We shouldn't be very much involved in conflicts of uh, interest of uh, chieftaincy because chieftaincy as it is, is uh, God's gift. If you are not ordained by God to be a chief, you cannot be a chief. So let us understand each other and live in peace. Come on. We have uh, some deposits like dolomite and uh, limestone also in some of the areas. And he was thinking that if some of these things uh, people or stakeholders get to know, maybe they can help develop the area. Three contrasting scenes telescoping into each other. These are the scars of communal violence that visited the land, the violence that is responsible for its lagging development. These and others put together were deterrents to tourists, yet at the center of Mkurugu lay a stone cast in the mold of the map of Africa, which in addition to the Nakpanduri scarp has the potential to draw visitors to both towns. This rock was not shaped by human being, it was naturally formed. And so when we were kids, we were told stories that Bimo was believed that they own Africa. And that story was told and told over and over again that Bimo was own Africa. And so <laughs> the essence of this rock, in our belief, is the fact that this is where you get all Bimo people.